I hope everyone's well. Um, with there being no football played at the non-elite level this season, or this month rather, I thought it'd be the perfect opportunity to get some insight into top-level refereeing. Therefore, I'm joined by Roger East, former Premier League referee, and Andy Kowalski, a long-serving registered referee to Middlesex FA, and also this year's Middlesex FA Grassroots Match Official of the Year winner. Roger, Andy, thanks for both coming on and giving up your time to speak to us tonight. Are you both well? Yeah, very well, thank you. Thank you very much. Good. And yeah, both, been, well both been coping all right with, with both lockdowns and everything that's gone on this year? Uh, well, from my point of view, it's manic because obviously I work for a family business, so I've not stopped at all. And if anything, I've worked harder. So um, and my household involves two nurses as well. So it's oh. been a bit of a manic household uh, <laughs> and uh, nothing stopped. I bet. What about you, Andy? Yeah, stuck in. My son's got COVID at the moment and uh, mother-in-law's moved in with us because uh, she's not been well. The three dogs are going mad because we can't go out. But apart from that, it's marvellous. <laughs> good, good. And I mean, sounds like you've both been busy, but for me, obviously, I've been, you know, furloughed and, and what have you. So I've had loads of time to to watch all the football on the telly. I don't suppose, you know, you guys have had much of a chance to, to watch it. And if you don't mind me asking, which which clubs do you both support? Uh, well, from my point of view, I was one of the, the very few that don't support anyone um, and never have done. OK. Uh, and the first time I had to actually tell the FA that I wasn't allowed to referee a side was in my very last season because my son, after three weeks, decided to tell me that he bought a season to get at Yeovil Town. Um, so I had to tell the FA that I couldn't referee Yeovil um, because obviously it wasn't, you know, wasn't proper like. Uh, yeah. And uh, they had a big laugh and said, are you really sure? And um, but I was just following protocol. There we go. <laughs> and sim cool. similar, my Dan actually, um, Arsenal wants to support Arsenal, so I'm not allowed to do any Arsenal games, uh, which is very disappointing. <laughs> <laughs> like it, good stuff. Um, and obviously, you two, you know, you, you're familiar with each other. You've worked together before. Just tell us a bit about that, and also, you know, the kick off at three event that you've both worked on together as well. Rog. Um, well, I think Kickoff at Three um, invited me to become an ambassador about, uh, well, it must be two or three years ago now. Um, and I think it's a marvellous thing to to try and help um, people of less privilege, um, let's be honest, in the in the inner city um, and uh, knife crime um, and looking at uh, helping people with leukaemia. Um, and I think um, the Kickoff at Three programme with Michael uh, Wallace and Ashley Levine um, is is a fantastic thing that helps lots of people. Um, and I got involved um, just as a referee and uh, they then became an ambassador. Um, and that's where I met Andy. Um, unfortunately or fortunately for him, I'm not sure. Um, but uh, we met and uh, we hit it off. And uh, and to be fair, we've uh, become friends ever since. He's a good dancer, by the way. The first time I met him, actually, was down at the Warren uh, where the <laughs> Metropolitan Police Centre was, and I got him dancing, and uh, that's been captured and put on Twitter. But uh, he's not a bad little mover, actually, to be fair. I've not seen that. You might have to send that one to me. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Brilliant. No, perfect. Thanks for that. Uh, we'll move on to some questions for you both. So, firstly, from myself, and then we'll pick out a couple of the questions asked by our own referees through Twitter and other social media platforms. So, Andy, I'll start with you. Um, the winner of this year's Grassroots Match Official of the Year Award in Middlesex. Congratulations on that. How, how did that feel? That's quite quite an achievement. I was I was very proud to be honest with you. Um, I think my refereeing career is I've got you know I'm a level five. Uh, that's the best that I'm going to ever get to for obvious reasons. It's a privilege to be recognised, and I I genuinely love it more than now I ever that ever have done. And I think that's because. I'm picking what I want to referee. Yeah, I'm liking the people I'm I'm, I'm being associated with, and, and it enhances you. And it really, you know, it really gives you it gives you a bit of a kick, you know, especially as you get on in your late fifties. Would you wouldn't know that yet, would you, Roger? I would. <laughs> <laughs> no, brilliant. I know you know you do several different types of football up and down the country, not just in the county. So you know, deserve winner, and you know, well done on that. It's really, really good stuff. Um, and in terms of, you know, both starting out in your refereeing journeys, uh, question for both of you, you know, how did you get into refereeing and, and what were your first memories in doing so? Um, well, from, from my point of view, um, I was a, a centre half um, that was my only attributes really, I could head it and run fast. Um, <laughs> and that was it. Um, and I often got told by the referee that I ought to become a referee because I moaned so much about referees. Um, 
and probably in my early 20s, I decided that I would go and do the course. Um, and I did the course um, and basically I used to play one day and referee the following day. Yeah. Um, Wiltshire in their wisdom then decided to, every time I refereed or played on a Saturday, they would send me back to that club on a Sunday to referee them um, to sort of try and, you know, coax me off playing. Yeah. Um, so eventually I used to play in one county because I lived on the Wiltshire Hampshire border and uh, referee in the other. Um, and then I started uh, getting put up through the system and started finding referees that recognized me from the previous day. And uh, so I had to decide. So in my early 20s, I decided that I would become a referee because I wasn't really very good at football anyway. Um, and uh, and I sat out in the local refereeing um, and enjoyed it immensely, to be fair. Um, and I probably only gave up football because I didn't want to travel. Um, and I didn't okay. want to travel into senior football. Um, so it, it's quite bizarre that really I ended up um, refereeing all over the country and, yeah. and traveling <laughs> twice as far. So, um, but no, I, I thoroughly enjoyed my my life as a referee and, and wouldn't change it for the world. Brilliant. Are you still refereeing? Are you still refereeing, Roger? Um, I was still refereeing um, before COVID. Um, I was still doing the odd game on a Sunday morning. Um, and last year, unfortunately, in the October, I had a stroke. Um, so I had to give up for a little while um, and uh, then found out that uh, I had atrial fibrillation, which is quite bizarre about all the fitness tests I used to do that they didn't ever spot that. Yeah. Um, but I'm now on tablets and fine. And um, so once uh, COVID's over, I'll go back to the gym and um, get a bit of the excess pounds off and uh, start refereeing again. <laughs> Good to hear. What, what level is that? Just county? Well, uh, as a, that's the one thing that me and Andy have in common, you see, because we're now both <laughs> level five. There we go. Yay. So, so when you're a level one and you, you ret- decide to retire, you go to level five. <laughs> that's why um, you're both on together, see, at the same level. So we're, we're both level five. So <laughs> I think I'm going to go for this Middlesex referee of the year. I'm going to move to Middlesex, I think. You got no chance, mate. No chance at all. <laughs> and you, Andy, in terms uh, of first memories? Yeah, my dad was a referee. Um, he, he was obviously Polish, my surname being Andy Kowalski. He, he came over after the war. Um, and I used to go and watch him over in Berks and Bucks and he used to go to the Polish club and I used to watch him and he was embarrassing. He was terrible. He was terrible. But he, had, he, he used to talk a lot and, and he used to get a lot of respect because of that. And um, I think after just watching him, I, I was no good at football. And I, I just I started about 20 years ago now, I think. And uh, my first memory was my first ever final. And it was White Hart City at Ellington Borough Football Club. And they, White Hart City, were from... White City, and uh, they were they were quite a lot of characters and those those teams at the time, and they brought some fans down, and uh, I had golden goal, and also had a streaker, so that was uh that was my earliest memory of the uh, sort of uh, my refereeing career. Easing you into it. <laughs> yeah, it's brilliant. <laughs> Good stuff. And in terms of you know, obviously, I'm sure both of your journeys you've you've you know, started many years ago, but. You know, did you have any main influences in your journey, whether it was starting out or for you at the elite level, Roger? Um, well, for me, I think the main influence was um, there was a local um, referee called Wally Tanner um, who insisted that I took refereeing seriously um, and basically prodded me for about two years. Um, and eventually I took heed. Um, and um, I think he appreciated it because it eventually went to a few decent games with me. So I think he enjoyed that. Um, to tell everyone that he got me started as referee. Yeah, uh, claim to fame. It, it made a good story for him as well. Um, but no, I think I think with local football, um, that's what we all start with. Um, and one of my earliest memories of local football was there was one particular side who had a very lot of, um, how would you call it, undesirable lads that were usually on a Saturday night getting taken away by the police, let's put it that way. Um, and uh, one of my first Sunday games was referee in this particular crowd um, who were quite scary to be fair um, and after sending one off and about three of them walking towards me I decided that I, I only had to take one stance and said if any of you come any more closer to me you're the next one to go at which point they stopped <laughs> and didn't quite know what to do and I breathed a big sigh of relief with the sweat running down my forehead and um, carried on with the game and, and I think that probably made my refereeing career locally um, to stand up to the the bully boys and not being uh, pushed about by them. Those under tens are terrible, aren't they? I've always <laughs> said about the under tens are shocking. <laughs> yes, they were. 
I can't remember the question, <laughs> to be honest with you. Um, <laughs> your main, main influences, anybody that's you know helped you in particular along, along the way? Uh, no, I think I, I, when I was, uh, my son was 16, he was played for Northwood and uh, I used to, I got sort of put in to manage them at one point and as usual thing you, when you become a manager of a youth side you're the manager the the kit washer the taxi everything and the referees never used to turn up um so I did a couple of games and I did okay I think and then I think after that I progressed and as I attained my level five years ago and uh yeah I'd say I've enjoyed it ever since but my, my main influence um I think it was just a lack of referees, to be frank, and yeah. referees that didn't talk to people, which is the most important feature now, I think, anyway. Yeah, no, absolutely. I'm sure you're, you're pretty good at that as well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I can see you two on camera. That's not fair. <laughs> no, it's everything. It is, communication is everything. As you can hear from Roger now, he's, um, he speaks he speaks so well and how he communicates with people is amazing and i think ultimately the football i you know i've got involved with uh be it all you know all the different echelons of it be it disability or anything if you explain yourself and you're courteous and you speak to people like an adult or you know whatever age group they are and explain what you're doing it goes a long way yeah couldn't agree more i guess that's for everything isn't it not just refereeing just all walks of life really i think so it's, yeah absolutely massive really and just another one for you, Andy. Um, in terms of you know your whole time refereeing in the county, up and down the country, as I know you often are. Um, any particular highlights? Any anything that sticks out? I actually enjoyed that representative game we were speaking about earlier. Um, it was it was a, I thought it was the under 16s and it was the under 18s, and they were a little bit faster and a little bit more challenging, and it was a feisty game. And you got the usual county people there, which is respectfully. Tip of hats with them. Uh, but as I say, the game, I thought I managed it probably it's probably one of my best games I've had for a long, long time. And and I enjoyed the game so much and the players acknowledged it at the end, which is all you want as a referee. You want to make sure that you're you know, you're not it's not about the referee, or it's about the game, isn't it? And participating and doing what's right sometimes. And yeah, that that's probably one of my highlights recently. And of course, obviously refereeing with Roger was the other highlight. <laughs> <laughs> you gotta say that, don't you? Yeah. Uh, He's a smooth idiot. <laughs> he is. <laughs> no. I've got some other stories about Roger I can tell you later, but I don't know if they're f- suitable for this. <laughs> <laughs> Save him for after, after yeah. the recording. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I've been um, also reliably informed that you, you've worked in the police force in your time, Andy. Um, I imagine many of those skills and experiences have um, stood you in good stead for, for refereeing. I think if you're the same person, wherever, whatever you do, uh, be yourself and be true to yourself it goes a long long way it's it's the same when you're communicating with a member of the public or someone you know one of Roger's under 10s you know is a little bit mouthy giving you a bit of you know a bit of grief you just speak to them and, and slow everything down and, and listen to what they're saying and then react accordingly and if you then got to say if you step forward so to speak you might have to deal with them in a different manner um, but the refereeing and policing is, have worked hand in hand and it's benefited both aspects I think um, yeah but with the kick off a three aspect of it that's uh, i think our skills have been invaluable i hope they have to ashley and mike and a uh, long way to continue yeah no absolutely um i mean you know highlights for you in terms of that representative game i'm sure roger you've got some some of yourself um can you remember your first premier league fixture and the teams involved and whether you had to make any any big decisions i can remember it very well um I was certainly not renowned to be a red card um, happy person. And interestingly enough, in my first uh, four Premier League games, I think I had four red cards. Yeah. Um, and I ended up, after 92 Premier League games, having 11. Wow. So that just to show is it was quite an interesting start. Um, I had a red card in my first game, a broken leg in the first game. Um and the red card was for someone kicking someone in the head. So that was that's quite a feat. It was um, Swansea against Sunderland. Yeah. In 2012, um, and uh, it was uh, Louis Saha was the one that got kicked in the head playing for Sunderland. Yeah. And um, I'm just trying to think of the guy I sent off. It was something like Louis Gomez or something. It was uh, it was a centre half with a big pigtail, 
And uh, oh, anyone, Flores, any, Swansea? Flores might have been, yeah. Yeah. Uh, anyone with a pigtail, I, I instantly forget because I've got Ferrari McTier. <laughs> um, but the, the one, I think, the funniest thing of the the whole thing, uh, Flores. I went down to do the um, as Premier League referees. We have to go to the club and talk them through the new laws. So it's the club visit, they call it. Yeah. So and they when they when I first started them, we used to go and train with the players. And uh, so off I went down to Swansea to train. And as per normal, Swansea, it was raining. Um, so Loudrup, who was the manager, gave me a Swansea coat to look in the same as the players, you see. So I go out. Now, bear in mind, I was 40, well into my 40s, let's put it that way. Um, and uh, he gave me a coat and off he went. And Flores uh, came up to me before we started training, tapped me on the shoulder and said, just remember, he said, it's only training. You don't have to send me off today. <laughs> Which was a great moment. And then they paired me with the guy that broke his leg. No. And the first, the first thing was actually to kick the ball at each other as hard as you possibly could and see if you could control it. Now, bear in mind, I'm a referee that wasn't very good at football. <laughs> and you've got a professional footballer kicking this damn ball at you. <laughs> and I have to say I had a few bruises after that. And But he thoroughly enjoyed it, to be fair to him. So... Neil Taylor, thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I, I think um, that was great. Um, and I say my next game, I'm on the red card. Um, Peter Oden Wingy. Yeah. To kick someone oh, right in front of the benches at Fulham. Um, and and I, that's how it went on. And um, my thir third red card was a, a guy called Ryan Shotton, um, who I sent off for a second yellow. And when I saw the replay, it was never a second yellow. And... Um, <laughs> <laughs> the worst thing about that particular story was I went and refereed uh, Middlesbrough against Derby. Yeah. Before the game, I spoke to uh, Ryan Schott, who was then playing for Derby. And um, I said, I'm ever so sorry about the one at Villa sent you off. There shouldn't have been a second yellow. And I sent him off after about 10 minutes for denial of an obvious course. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I'm a nasty man. Mate. Couldn't write that, could you? Uh, and you couldn't write it. No. You couldn't write that. And I'm, like you said, I mean, obviously making an error for that second yellow card and you know refereeing at the top level comes with a lot of pressure after making an error like that you know how did you overcome that did you have anything that you did yourself or was it just you know your own way to get over it quickly I think it's it's um it's devastating um and you learn over a number of years to obviously uh change your philosophy I, I wasn't a great watcher back um okay. I only used to watch it back if I if I'd seriously got something wrong position wise um, so you obviously then analyse if I'd have been a different place, would have had a different de decision. Um, but bear in mind, I sent this guy off and 22 players thought I was right. Really? Yeah. One person thought I was wrong. And it was only after um, 24 replays on match of the day that yeah. they decided I was wrong. Um, so I'm, I'm still not convinced I was completely wrong. But unfortunately, the pictures don't lie. Yeah. I mean, to be fair, you can slow down most decisions and you can find, you know, Two different, two yep. different outcomes, can't you? So, you know, I think in the in the speed of you know full speed of the game, if I think you can kind of gauge whether or not you've had the right the decision by by the reaction of others as well. I think the other thing is you you have to be to referee that level. You have to be um, in some ways supremely self confident because you are going to get things wrong. Um, and every time I used to go to a society and and they used to they they would always blast you for the one you got wrong. Yeah, and and I would always say to them that. Um, there's 20,000 referees in the country and, and somehow by hook or by crook, I managed to get to the top, um, which meant that I wasn't too bad. Yeah. And that's, that was always my answer. <laughs> Did you have any particular players or managers that you found difficult to manage or, or deal with? Um, gen generally, I think what Andy said is that um, I tried to show the guy on the gate as much respect as the manager of the Premier League side. Yeah. And um, I showed them all the same courtesy. Um, and that held me in good stead because people will always help you if you're polite and courteous to them and, and uh, in inverted commas, a nice guy, if, if that makes sense. Um, but that's for others to say. Um, but I think that I mean, I always found it quite difficult with one or two managers. Um, Gary Rowett didn't particularly like me. Um, but then again, you know, that's that's life. Uh, yeah. And other managers like me. Um, and I got on very well with some players and other referees didn't get on with them. Um, so I think 
it's just about your personality um out of i don't know how many thousand ref, uh, players or managers i saw um there was i can count them on my hand the ones i didn't really get on with yeah um which i i think that's a reasonable success well 100 percent, i'd say so do you have anybody you know players that you've refereed matches on that you thought stood out in terms of ability uh, as the best that you've you've seen up close on the line um and this is name dropping andy andy would give me some stick about it. But when, I, when i when i lined at the san zero um oh here we go here we go again go. <laughs> had um perlo so inzaghi um maldini Sub names yeah they had a, a wonderful side and the one that really stood out was perlo yeah um and up close i think he's probably the best footballer i've seen um up close and, and certainly abroad um in the home countries um probably one of the best players i refereed was suarez okay um because he would twist and turn and fall over it and i still even now i haven't got a clue whether it's a foul or not <laughs> um he was wonderful at that and and that's not to say he dived because no. most, of time, most of the time he got kicked yeah uh, um and in addition on the line probably Bergkamp was the best before that OK. Um, and the one that really surprised me, because I didn't really rate him until I refereed him, was Wayne Rooney. Yeah. And Wayne Rooney up close is a fabulous footballer. Yeah. Uh, really. And, and, a, and a nice guy. And is he? Yeah. Nothing like you would imagine. He's very courteous, very quiet. On the pitch as well? Off the pitch. Um, on the pitch, he has his moments. Yeah. <laughs> um, but we used to have a good, um, let's say, chat. And, yeah. Uh, we always uh, shook hands at the end, so we didn't do too bad. No, you got any names to compare with that, Andy? Oh yeah, yeah. I actually refereed at Chelsea, did a corporate game, very good. <laughs> uh, no, no. I'll tell you one thing: it's about making mistakes. And I, I just um, a little tribute to someone who has passed away recently. It was Isaac Jembele. Uh As usual, we had, I had a cup game. Uh, I think it was over at Feltham, and Isaac turned up late as usual. I think it was five minutes to kick off. Uh, the game shouldn't have been played because the. I was a lino that day and the left side, it was potholes and everything. And he said, nah, it'd be fine, Andy, it'd be fine. Anyway, I couldn't run and I was doing a Scooby-Doo. If you know what I mean when you do a Scooby-Doo with your feet are going, but you're not making any momentum. <laughs> uh, goal kick, I've flagged, haven't I? I've, I've put the flag up. It's not offside. <laughs> of course, they've gone through and scored. I've left the flag up and I think, oh, crap, I've got it wrong. And I'm getting berated. And Isaac came over and he said, what did you see, Andy? I said, Isaac, I've cocked up. And he said, did you say it flicked off the player's head? I said, exactly. And, and, and he got me out of that, that, you know, that hole. And um, he was a lovely, lovely guy. And I know people in Middlesex are sort of... Um, who, who knew Isaac? Well, it's sad that he's passed away, but uh, yeah, he got me out of trouble that day. That's a great story, and yeah, just on the back of that, I mean, I've, he was in this role before me, and honestly, one of the nicest people you'll ever meet, and you know, shocking and devastating for us all that have worked with him and everybody that's ever met him. You know, like I said, one of the nicest guys, and always be remembered in the county for sure, for sure. Right. Um, and Roger, just kind of on the back of your. Premier League career, you retired from professional refereeing in May of last year. Um, yep. Right. Was that a difficult decision, or was that something that you had on your mind for a little while? No, I think um, I had it on my mind. Um, the last game I refereed was on my 54th birthday, um, which broke the record for the oldest ever in the Premier League. There we go. Um, it's the only thing I actually hold as a record. I know it's not much of one, but it's the only <laughs> one I've got. I, I, I didn't do anything else apart that, that is really remote, remotely sort of worth thinking about. But <laughs> I'm the oldest ever, so that's good enough for me. Um, and I decided that at that time that was probably a good idea. Um, I asked the management if I could go out because the last day of the season, which is previously they didn't ever let people retire on the last day. Right. Um, okay. Just in case it was something on the game or, you know, a place in the league or... Um, and I suppose they always did it the week before or the weekend before. Um, but to be fair to the management, I'd asked, said, uh, can I go out on the last day of the season? I know you don't normally uh, let people do, but because it's my birthday on that day, um, that's when I want to go. Um, and uh, they said, that's fine, uh, providing you don't pick one of the glamour ties, obviously. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, but I didn't want to go to the glamour tie. I wanted to go somewhere with atmosphere. 
yeah. and which would be a good game. Um, and I chose uh, Crystal Palace against Bournemouth. Nice. Um, which is a great atmosphere at Palace, if you've ever been there. Um, and it was uh, 5-3 oh. scoreline. Um, wow. And all my family were in the, one of the boxes. Um, so we had a great day. Not a bad way to go out, that is it? It was a great way to go out. Yeah. So and no, it wasn't a difficult decision. I I got to the stage where I wanted to retire, um, and I enjoyed what I did, but I didn't want to outstay my welcome. Yeah, absolutely. No, brilliant. Um, and just a, one more question, just on on that, really. I mean, in your time refereeing at the top level, have you got a match that stood out? Maybe not necessarily. Maybe the the most high profile, but maybe the most eventful, if it wasn't your first game? <laughs> um, I think probably one of the best games I've ever refereed, um, and and probably not only because of the atmosphere, but also because um, of decisions that were actually correct. And um, it was very rare for me to get everything correct, as you know, Andy, before you say anything. Um, so this particular game was uh, Southampton against Liverpool. Um, and Liverpool were 2-0 up. And absolutely coasting. Yeah. Could have yeah. been five up. And uh, they scored a goal, which I disallowed for the guy in front of the goalkeeper. And it was one of these decisions where I had half the jigsaw, the assistant had the other half. And obviously, with communication systems, it makes it very easy to come to the right decision. So when Liverpool are obviously celebrating, I'm now disallowing the goal. Um, deemed to be correct afterwards, so that was good. Um, and Southampton came back and won 3-2. And... Um, Ronald Koeman, who was the manager, ran down the touchline and dived in with the Southampton supporters or got involved with them or something. Yeah. And, uh, so I went across the bench and I said, Ronald, um, it's unlike you to do things like this. And you realise that you're not allowed to do it. And he said, uh, I'm ever so sorry. And I said, so consider yourself told off. <laughs> and, and went back and, and, uh, I didn't think it was any good really throwing him in the stand because... He, he was always a guy that never really caused a problem. So I, I left him to it. Yeah, brilliant. And I know you mentioned there in terms of, you know, communication with, with your the rest of your team. Um, what is that like at the top level? I mean, you know, before, during, after the games, obviously we don't see, you know, the conversations that happen when, when you've got the the, the mic um, during the game. You know, tell us a little bit about those I communications. Think, well, I think... Um, when you go up through the system, and obviously I think they start the communication systems at national league level. I think I'm right in saying that. Um, and the communication between the assistants at that level to the next level to the next level, each level was a step up with information you're given and the quality of what you're given. Yeah. Um, and to be fair to the guys at the Premier League and international league, um, their their information they give you is second to none. Yeah. Um, and refereeing the game becomes easier by being given information. Um, and obviously, I probably benefit in being an international assistant for a few years um, by giving the information to the um, referees. I was one of the first internationally to use this communication system. Okay. Um, so I sort of grown up with it when they started. Um, and they are really, really good. Um, and I think it's a shame that I say it's a shame if the public could hear what you say, um, I think they would appreciate a bit more. Yeah. Um, sure. But I, I also think it can be misconstrued. So it would, it's probably better not to be in the public eye. Yeah. No, I understand that completely. And I know you said, you know, refereeing abroad. Did you have opportunity or experiences being an extra official in UEFA games at all? No, I was um, between 2003 and um, 2007. Um, I was an international assistant referee, so 2005, 2007, actually. Um, but we, we sort of, in those days, you went the year before as well on a number of games. Um, and I ran the line. I was on the shortlist for the World Cup and Euros um, and just come back from um, Portugal and did the under-21 championship final um, and then decided to become a referee. Yeah. So I, had the, I had the choice of coming off the shortlist. Oh, yeah. um, and I came off the shortlist and I, I would have had a decent chance. Um, I'm not saying I would have gone, um, but let's say that when I came off, I was probably above the pecking order of the two that went. Right, okay. In Euros. And, and that's not to say, because they were fantastic, because obviously um, Mike Malarkey and Darren Cam went yeah. uh, and became household names on the line. 
So, and they're fantastic assistants. So um, I'm not saying I was anywhere near them, but I was at one time above them. <laughs> <laughs> no, he's not, he's not bitter, is he? He's not bitter. <laughs> no, <laughs> no I, I don't mind at all because I want to become a referee. So um, yeah, there we go. It, wasn't, it wasn't really a, a hard decision. There we go. Perfect. Um, just obviously staying on the assistant referee topic for you, Andy. Um, one topic I thought would be interesting to ask would be the differences in having club assistant referees and also those neutral competition appointed assistants. And, you know, how does your approach change when dealing with with either of those? I'm I'm pretty much the same. Obviously, a, a, a proper referee is going to be assistant. Knowledge is a lot better. Uh, and it, it's more professional, obviously. But I'm just going to deviate slightly. I, I'm talking about experiences, and it is relevant. I, I had an, an FA Cup ladies game, Arsenal versus uh, Torquay. First time, I've got an Arsenal programme with my name on it. It's amazing. I'm, the, I'm an assistant you know, for an <laughs> FA Cup tie. Yeah. And it was Mark Sennett in the middle. No, I'm quite diligent when I do, um, you know, when I get my kit ready, I've got my bag ready. I got to the ground two and a half hours before I should have done, and, you know, because I was excited. It was down at Ballroom Wood. And I get there and I'm trying to get ready. I forgot my shorts. I forgot my shorts. So anyway, from there, it's gone downhill to the extent where I've had to wear a pair of Mark Senate shorts. Now, I'm the 36 and he was about a 34, so it didn't look good. <laughs> you can imagine what I looked like. And then he had us doing right wings. <laughs> Why? Why did he have to do right wings? And so I, I was a mess. But no, in, in respect of um, Mike, I've got no real experience in lining. I wish, I mean, I think we should, uh, I've, I had not had enough training on lining. It's such a difficult skill, to be honest. So much respect for that. I'm, I hate lining now. It's, it's such a difficult skill. Yeah, I bet. I mean, we've got a, I'll do a little plug on it in, in the middle of the recording. If anyone hasn't signed up yet, we've got an assistant referee workshop on the 30th of this month. So, that's being delivered by Andy Williams, who's on the line in the um, in the EFL at the moment. So that'll be done online on the 30th of November. So if anyone's watching and you know hasn't signed up yet, drop me a line and I'll, I can get you signed up for that. Perfect. And you know, in terms of um, you know the start of your career to now, Andy, can you pinpoint any any differences of how grassroots football was, you know, 20 years ago when you started to? So how it is now, has it changed much at all? Uh, I'm not sucking up to county, but county over the last two or three years have really stepped up. I think the new blood coming in has been amazing. Um, like what you're doing now and other little courses you're running, there's what what's needed. Um, I think there's still a big gap between the younger referees and the older referees. The, the middle part tends to get left out. We do, we do need repeat training. Um, we're just left to get on with it, to be honest. And the retention levels, I don't know what they're like now. I understand they've dropped quite badly due, during COVID. But yeah, I think I think we should mandate some things as well. I think that'd be really useful. And I think even though people would object, if we mandate things, we're going to probably improve how we do things, which I think yeah. is really important. No, I agree. And, you know, we're working all the time to try and make those things better. And like you said, retention of referees at the moment is, is the hardest thing and um, not just for us but for all counties i'm sure you roger yeah. being based in wiltshire have heard similar stories over there it's, it's it's i mean all the leagues are asking for referees um and um i think it's the same you know same problem you know country-wise they say but um I, I think it's difficult obviously we're in difficult times um and um how you retain people i mean there's there's lots of theories about why people go um my theory is the fact that there is a lot more things you can do with your spare time. Yeah. And there is less spare time because of the um, the job market entails you need to work more hours per week. Um, and obviously with a family life, I think generally speaking, you've got a husband and wife, shall we say, that, that obviously both work. Um, and if you then sort of clear off both days for the weekend to referee, um, you haven't really given your wife a break. And I think that's that's it's not necessarily things that we're doing wrong as a football nation. It's just society in general. Um, and I think you just need to keep as many people as you can. Um, and I, and I, I sort of disagree in some ways. I think you just can't get too het up about some people leaving or some people doing less games. Yeah, no, like, like you said, everyone's got their own things going on, especially at the moment. You know, people aren't too sure whether it's safe to to referee obviously there's guidelines in place but you know it's a, and a you know tough time for everyone at the moment and you know we've been in a position where we've not been able to run as many courses as we'd like 
So therefore, on a knock-on, you know, you have fewer referees, and like you said, obviously that you know um, impacts on the leagues, and everybody's looking for referees, and you know, people are having to fill in when they can. So hopefully, you know, from next season onwards, we'll be able to kind of turn turn the ship around and you know move it in an upwards trend once again. Um, what you know, kind of on the back of that, what advice would you have to to any referees starting out? in the game, you know, just looking to join a course or have just completed a course? I think young referees, I mean, we, we do a few things locally um, and um, he's trying to support the young referees um, and coach them through their first few games um, with a mentor scheme or, or whatever. But I mean, they need to support um, to, to go anything. <clears throat> I did an interesting, um, I had a young referee locally. Um, he was quite nervous. Um, it's starting. Um, so I went along with him with his first game and said to the two managers, um, if he gets anything wrong or if, if he's unsure about something, he's going to come across and ask me. And they went, oh, OK, we are, we're fine with that. We're happy with that. And it, it's, it's a little bit out of the box. And I understand that. And uh, during the 90 minutes, he came across once to ask me about a law about offside. And uh, I got him to tell me what he thought first. And I said, you're dead right. Carry on. And, and it gave him the confidence that now I think he's on his about 10th game now, 15th game. Yeah. Um, he goes out on his own, gets a few of the local lads to go and watch him. Um, and he's really coming on. And I think that sort of thing um, is invaluable to them. Um, but what advice I would give them is to enjoy it because refereeing is there to be enjoyed. Um, you're not going to get everything right. Um, but if you get most things right, most people appreciate it. Yeah. Um, and uh, you're going to get games when you're going to come home and you're going to throw the bag in the corner of the room and say, <laughs> I'm never refereeing ever again. And, and I always say that the biggest advice is, is the following day, pick that bag up and go back out because that'll get better. Um, and uh, I think we've all been there um, in any refereeing career. And if you haven't, you're lying. <laughs> so so um, and, and that's all you can give to people, really. Uh, but above all, to enjoy it. Yeah, no, I agree. And like you said, I mean, I think mentors more than ever are really important for people starting out with something that we're trying to increase our, you know, the amount of mentors that we have um, qualified in the county so we can actually, you know, have a better spread around the county in terms of geographically, north, south, centre, yeah. wherever, uh, to ensure we can get people out to games and actually give those referees who need it the support. So like you said, even if it's only for the first couple of games, just just pointers here and there to give them the confidence to then go on and, and referee um, confidently um, there on in. So I think that's really important. Um, yeah, go is, on. Is, is there any way that they can be almost um, encouraged to do women's football? Uh, it's a much slower game of less, intent, uh, less intensity, but less less verbal. You know, there's not so many verbals involved. And, and I think you can get a lot of confidence doing women's football. I know they do a lot of youth football when they first qualify. And I think that can be to their detriment sometimes. It is so difficult doing youth football. Um, it's it's a nightmare. I, I'd rather go and do a Sunday a Sunday morning game, you know, with blokes that have been down the pub, and then do a one of youth football games sometimes. This and I think if, if you can maybe pigeonhole them to do women's football, I think they've done an awful lot. But generally, yeah. I think people they need to explore different like walking football. I love I love walking football, Roger. You've got to do it. You you could probably become the FIFA walking football ref. I'll tell you. <laughs> well, you're, probably, you're probably gonna have that dream, but yeah. it is brilliant to referee, and it's really really difficult. But it's a different skill because your communication skills are far beyond your actual decision making in respect to be blowing your whistle. You can, you've always got to be talking, but it's brilliant. But anyway, sorry, I've digressed a bit. But no, no, get them no. just. We're, we're too. I think we can be a little bit too single-minded and going one track only. Um, yeah. yeah, referee men's football. Just deviate slightly and show them how to have fun, like Roger said. You know, and he he actually uh, had a similar conversation with some boys, a uh, recent kickoff of free event, and they were mesmerised by how he was speaking to him because he makes you feel. I'm not Roger. I'm not sucking up to you, mate. Seriously, generally, how he makes people feel. He, he, he you, you almost want to not embrace him physically. I don't want to embrace him physically, but he, how he speaks is brilliant, and you can empathise with it, and you can relate to it at all levels. Uh, you know, whether you're a level seven or whatever you are, it's brilliant. Yeah, no, perfect, and you know, can see it tonight. You know, brilliant from both of you. Really, chemistry between you is, you know, great, and you can see you've worked together, and it's just a good, you know, good laugh. But also, 
you know, good information and insight for all the refs that are going to be watching this back. So really, really useful. And I know, you know, you said you're very interested in walking football. Andy, I know you, you've been heavily involved in disability football as well. Um, how did that start? And, you know, when did that kind of come about for you? Was that early on? Or is that something that's kind of just come about in the last few years? The last few years, I think it's 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 like uh, as you evolve as a person, I think you want to learn more about people and uh, how things are. We, we we could be quite not ignorant, but maybe we just don't understand people. But I, I think I did a, a deaf game once, and that was it, it, it's it's such a strange thing to to know to actually undertake, but it's so rewarding as well. And the disability football, where you have people with physical disabilities or mental health you get to learn to talk to them in a different way and interact with them in a different way and they love it they just you're then as i said earlier then part of their game and you're part of the game and it is so rewarding personally uh, I, so i've not enjoyed football so much as i you know in the last three or four years than i had the rest of my career yeah. and it's i just encourage people to look at other different you know different um genres of football so to speak and uh, and get involved it's, it's very humbling um if I can go on with what Andy said, is that um, a few years ago I went to Hong Kong to do the Hong Kong Sevens, and they you, you basically referee all day long, and it's it's ex pros like ex masters, ex professional footballers all playing the games. And there's one game they ask you to do, and it's called the Crusaders, and um, they're in a corner of the pitch. Um, the special needs kids play this one little game. Yeah. Um, and they get the Premier League referee to referee it. And it, 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 it's it's a very, very humbling experience because yeah. the, the whole crowd are in that corner cheering them on. And at the end of it, they go um, to a presentation where all their parents are there um, and you have to present them with a medal. And I have to say that's it was unbelievable. Um, it made me feel whilst not only proud for doing it, but also quite humble in the fact that um, of how much enjoyment you've let them have yeah. by free in a game like that. And I think what Andy said is it's if you've never done one of those games, um, it is a really good experience. Yeah, no, for sure. And I can imagine incre incredibly rewarding. Oh, to do. Yeah. like unbelievable. And, you know, before, you know, taking up this role at Middlesex, I'm not like I won't lie, I didn't have half the information I know now about, you know, disability football, how much there actually is, whether it's power chair football, mm. you know, amputee football, disability football, deaf, whatever. There's so many different types yeah. and it's played on a such a wider scale, more so than people think. And, you know, the work, you know, even some professional clubs are doing now is, you know, really, really good. And hopefully, you know, with a more inclusive the world's becoming, that that's only going to only going to grow in the years to come. So, you know, hopefully you might might both be um uh, yeah i think pa parachair we, we i did a parachair game at um, west ham uh, where they the premier league did a um interesting with with the various people on the pitches and and they put the obviously the parachairs inside um and it was quite interesting because some of the parents were quite upset that they were put inside um and uh, they were probably even more upset because i said that they were being have to put up with me all day long because i'm going to be refereeing it and i'd never seen a parachair game and they literally said, uh, well, there you go. It's it's five minutes each way or whatever. Off you go then. And I, I went across to the parents and I said, look, you, you're you going to have to fill me in on the rules because I haven't got a clue. And uh, so that that broke the ice with them. And then they yeah. told me all about the rules and regulations. Um, and by the end of the day, um, they came up and say, thank you very much. You've you know enhanced our uh, day. And we were very upset when we first got here and wanted to kill everyone because we were inside. Um, but uh, But thanks anyway. You know, so, so it's good. Brilliant. Um, last question for me, and then we'll move on to just a couple of questions, like I mentioned earlier, from our referees. Um, obviously, Roger, like we mentioned earlier, you retired from um, professional refereeing in May of last year. Um, did you have any experiences with um, VAR? Have you? Have you? Um, I, I was obviously. Um, I did all the training for VAR. Yeah. Um, and I refereed with VAR in place in league cup games okay um so i was i've had an experience of obviously disallowing a goal that originally i'd given yeah. that sort of thing um through handball um leicester southampton in the cup um when a guy handballed it en route to goal it probably wasn't deliberate but the, uh, yeah the laws of the game stated yeah. that it was 
you know, before a goal. Um, and so that was interesting because um, when I came off the pitch, Mark Hughes said to me, he said, uh, Roger, he said, you weren't going to disallow that. And I said, well, no, I didn't disallow it. And he said, I know you didn't. He said, but that VAR did. <laughs> I said, yeah, but I said, I handballed it. And he said, uh, yeah, I suppose he did, really. And that was that was the only thing he said. <laughs> <That's it. laughs> um, but, uh, I mean, I, I'm i sort of, um, I think the actual essence of VAR is fantastic. Yeah. Um, to, to If you referee, shall we say, in Manchester, 250 miles away, you make a mistake. Uh, driving 250 miles home is not a very pleasant experience, I can tell you. Um, especially when the whole, whole of the radio is going mad. Yeah. Roger Reese has made a, a right noggin. Um, so I think to be able to change that before you drive home has got to be better. Um, I think the implementation of it uh, could be better or could be worse, whichever way you look at it. Yeah. Um, it could be different. Um, but I think the main thing is, is that the media have to get on board with accepting it because at the moment it's media driven about how bad it is um rather than how bad the decision really is yeah um and unfortunately that's not quite worked out um a bit of a pr disaster i mean they just need someone to work with the media and make sure they know it's not as bad as they think it is uh, yeah i'm i'm just looking from the outside now and um i've got i wouldn't say i've got no interest in it because i, I watch national league yeah uh, south is a coach um, so I'm enjoying that immensely. Um, and uh, VAR really is is way above my pay grade now. Yeah, <laughs> leave that alone. Who is it that you're um, coaching at the minute? I have five level 2B referees. So oh. I'm coaching the 5B referee, uh, 2B referees in the uh, southwest. Yeah. Um, so the FA asked me if I'd be a core coach when I retired. Um, and I wanted to do something rather than just go home and lock the door. Um, so that's what I did. Um, and uh, I had six last year, and and one for some reason got promoted. So um, <laughs> I could have done that about the job. And yeah. uh, so I now have five this year. That's all right, so, isn't it? No, so good. It's good. I'm enjoying. No. It. And a good good polo as well. And they give me a polo. That's all right, isn't it? One, one every two years now with the FA <laughs> instead of a box for every week with the Premier League. So. <laughs> Roger, they do me an extra large. <laughs> I'll see if I can get you Andy sorry yeah, okay. <laughs> right well we'll move on to just a couple of questions from um, our referee so firstly we've got a question from Ben Tucker Ben's a level 7 referee his question is and we touched a bit on this earlier but he says what do you see as the biggest danger to referee participation levels at grassroots um, so in terms of stopping involvement at the start and also then impacting on retention whilst they're, they're actually refereeing. If you were advising the FA, what would be your advice? Roger. Oh, I think that's one for you, Andy, to start with. I'll think about it. <laughs> and just as you say, I think what you, what just highlighted, they've got to enjoy it. So that, that, that's from a pathway. They, they don't just do youth football or... I put them into ladies football. Ladies football is huge now, as we all know, and it's the mentality is different, uh, and it's far less stressful as a referee refereeing, refereeing women than it is men, because men innately can be uh, daft and um, be unreasonable. Women can be the same, believe it or not, but it's 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 so much more pleasurable doing women's games, um, and I'm sure Roger's going to endorse that, aren't you, Roger? Um, yeah, I mean, I I think you're right, and and I think. In addition to that, I think the the one thing you have to instill in people that start refereeing is the is the camaraderie that refereeing has, the same as if you play in a team. Um, and to do that, you have to bring them together, whether all the sevens are brought together or all the eights or whatever level they are, are brought together. Um, and then you try and, I would say, install them with a bit of confidence or or bore them to death with people like me, um, speaking them to a 10 minutes, or, or any, any senior referees in the county, um, to say, look, you know, this, this is what you can achieve if you start off and you work your way through the system and you work hard and you do all the right things and you train well. Um, and the higher you up you get, the more you will enjoy it. Because um, I certainly would say that as much as I enjoy grassroots level football, I thoroughly enjoy Premier League more. Yeah. Um, and I think 
any sport you play, um, I'm a great believer in um, participating is brilliant. Um, but the better you get at that sport, the more you'll enjoy it. Yeah, no, for sure. No, that's brilliant. Brilliant. Um, and then we've got one more. So this is from Aidan Dyke Lawler, another level seven referee for you, Roger. So he wanted to ask you about um, refereeing the Tripoli Derby in Libya in 2006. <laughs> he said it'd be interesting to know what that was like and also for an English official to travel out and referee in a country that's so different from ours. Well, first of all, I was a linesman um, in those okay. days, assistant referee. Um, so the, the three of us went, there was um, Dave Bryan, um, re retired Premier League assistant as well, myself with two assistants, and the referee was Mark Halsey. Um, Mark um, phoned me up about three weeks before we went and he said, Roger, he said, uh, we've been asked to go to Libya. <laughs> and I said, I, I said, oh, OK, I said, uh, are we the cannon fodder? <laughs> and he said, no, no, he said, seriously, he said, we've been asked to go to Tripoli. He said to, to referee um, the top two Tripoli sides, they're first and second in the league um, and uh, they want to match officials to go out there. They've asked for a French team or an English team to go. Anyway, the French team offered League Two officials and the English team, they offered us three FIFA guys because we were the three stupid ones that wanted to go, probably. <laughs> and and uh, so off we went. And uh, I think at the time it was about five times the fee of a normal international game. Was it? A bit of danger money. I, I, so yeah. I was more nervous when I went there because I'm thinking, well, they, they must be paying this money for some reason. Anyway, so off we went. And uh, we were picked up at the airport and uh, by uh, Gaddafi's bodyguards. And this is true. So the, the car had the Gaddafi symbol on it. And off we get in these cars with these four guys who you didn't want to argue with. And uh, off we went. Uh, we get to the game. Uh, we turned up uh, three and a half hours before the game to look at the pitch. And they were already going into the stadium three and a half hours before. And... Uh, when we got there, I think there was fifty-five or 60,000 people at this game. And uh, on the line, um, there's a load of flares that, that come down as little parachutes. Yeah. And I'm having them thrown at me with bricks all through the game. <laughs> now, luckily, there's a running track around the pitch. So by the time it got to me, it, it would run out of steam. Good so job it was, yeah. It, 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 they sort of brushed you rather than hurt you. So the game goes on, and uh, one of the sides is winning 1-0. <laughs> Uh, we get towards the end of the game and uh, the corner's to be taken and um, the, the goalkeeper came up and he was a very, very big man. And he came up for the corner and headed the equaliser. So you imagine this stadium now erupts. The guy has come up from the back. The goalkeeper has headed the equaliser. He's done a lap of the track in celebration. There's flares going, a red, green flares, um, both sides. The whole place is just in mayhem. And I'm looking at Mark Halsey and I'm just saying to them, don't cause him. Whatever you do, don't yeah. cause him. Because the side is basically waiting for him to restart. And they're not complaining that he's running around the track. They're expecting it. So you run around, it goes back in. Uh, two seconds later, whistle blows, end the game, one all, everyone's happy. We go back to the hotel and, and the police are there. And they said, uh, I said, oh, obviously you've had a great day, you know, good result. Everyone's happy. He said, we're delighted. And I said, oh, it's, it's a good result then for you. He said, no, he said, it's a good result for one reason. I said, why is that? He said, in Tripoli, if a side wins, they turn the cars over on the street and set light to them. He said, because it's a draw, they won't do that. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I think that's, that's a different game. This is, I'm, I'm glad I don't referee in Tripoli every week. Oh, what when was that? What year was that? Um, it would have been about 2005. I'm just trying to see if it's on YouTube. <laughs> yeah, the question came into 2006. So I don't know if, if he did some there's some research. In that, so. 2005. I mean, I was as I say, I was an assistant internationally 2004 to 2007. Yeah, I thought it was about five uh, somewhere in there. So it might might be in the five six season. Tell you what, Aidan, I'm so glad you've asked that question because what a story question. that is. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> what a story that is. But the, the best bit about the whole story is. Uh, I don't know whether you know Dave Bryan. He's a lovely, lovely guy. And uh, and uh, But we always kept losing him because when we got to the hotel, they said, you can go to the hotel, you can go to any restaurant you like, have what you like, um, anything you want, put it on room service. 
they looked after us like kings, to be fair to them. And uh, But every time we came down to meet, to go somewhere, we were lacking Dave Bryan. And uh, Dave Bryan was on the top balcony in the coffee shop with the biggest chocolate tea cake or, or <laughs> muffin that you'd ever seen, plastered all across his face every time we were meant to be leaving to go somewhere. And he must have cleaned them out of those chocolate muffins. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Unreal. Like, that is a story that you wouldn't, story. you wouldn't get that. You wouldn't see that online. I've, I've not heard that one before. That's a great bit of insight. Great bit of insight. And that is officially the last last of the questions. Ah. Don't know if you've got any, any last words for our referees. I just want to say to Roger, um, he's... This, this gentleman, and I don't want to embarrass you, Rog, he does so much for people, for charity. I'd say, uh, you know, punting about the kickoff at three, he travels from Wiltshire um, to wherever we may be in the country, and he supports, the, the, you know, the kickoff at three initiative. He supported the Josh Hansen Trust uh, initiative. That gentleman was sadly murdered. He does so much for people, and he's a genuine, genuine guy. I think Middlesex, if they can do make this as a regular feature, It'd be beneficial um, for everyone, and I think he, his knowledge and how he delivers it uh, is it, it, it's just get hold of him, Dan. Get Middlesex boys to get hold of him and do this once a year, or have a dinner down there. He can do a he could do a dinner dinner date, and I think it, it, some of the younger refs and certainly us older refs would really really enjoy it. He's he's a terrific gentleman, and it's it's been a real privilege to get to know him. That's kind, Andy, and uh, I'll give you the fiver because obviously I told you to say that. Earlier. <laughs> Um, I like it. Oh, was it a tenner? Oh, sorry about that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but, um, but no, I think I think the important thing about uh, football is uh, um, is for everyone. And um, I know Andy says that, but uh, my philosophy has always been to treat people how you want to be treated yourself. Um, and however important you think you are, there's always someone more important. <laughs> <laughs> no, brilliant. Thank you both. A lot for this. This has been a great insight, great stories, great, you know, chat between the two of you. It's been been really, really good. So thanks a lot again for, for the time and you know everything that's gone into it. I really appreciate it. And I hope everyone that watches this back will enjoy it as much as as much as I have doing it. So thank you. Thanks, Dan. Thanks, uh, Dan. Thank you, Dan. Take care, guys. Talk to you soon.